You recently wrote about how efforts to thwart piracy end up hurting writers, authors, and other content creators. How does it hurt? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not just any efforts to fight piracy. It's specifically saying that intermediaries, um, uh, web hosts, uh, online services, payment processors, social networks, have to be uh, responsible for all the content posted to them. Okay. Um, because those services are, are how authors who are independent of the regular publishing industry um, reach their audience, right? That, that mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's a big group of people who can write books and a much smaller group of people who can operate PayPal. And if you, you, know, if you converge the two on a Venn diagram, you don't get an overlap so much as a sphincter, right? right? So the, um, the, if you're going to be an independent, you need those services to exist, and those services can't exist if they're responsible for policing everything. Imagine trying to know a priori whether or not any money that flows through PayPal involves a copyright infringement. Imagine trying to police YouTube. They have 72 hours of video every minute, right? So it's right. three days of video a minute. There's just, there's no way in heaven or hell they could possibly do this. So it seems pretty self-evident to me that if you raise the, the bar on um, what these hosts and services are supposed to do, you will essentially put them out of business or require them to operate like cable TV where you have to either put some money in to get on or you have to pay an insurer to indemnify them to get on, which is the same thing from the perspective of a creator. And independent creators can't afford that. That would destroy right. their margins. So one way or the other, no independent creators. Now, why does that matter to people like me who publish with one of the big five? Mm -hmm. Well, the reason is that if you're going in to negotiate a deal with a publisher, the worst deal they can offer you has to be better than the best deal you can get for yourself. Okay. Right? Yeah. So it, 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 the existence of Amanda Hawking, even if you don't want to be Amanda Hawking, changes the, the worst contract that you can get uh, because they're, you know, you sort of, you're estimating, well, I'm going to put this many hours into this book, and I'm going to get this many dollars out of this book. What's my expectation if I try it on my own? If the expectation when you try it on your own is better, then the publishers will lose substantial numbers of books, as will studios and labels lose musicians, movies, uh, to the independent marketplace. So um, basically, big five publishers, big media companies can handily maneuver in a world in which all those online services go away. The reason we know this is true is they all existed before all those services came about. Mm -hmm. um, it's only those independent, nimble, new kinds of businesses and individuals that can operate, uh, that, that require those services to operate. So what we must be very careful of is letting the war on piracy actually turn out to be a, um, a kind of, you know, um, destruction, you know, wholesale destruction of the ecosystem of services available to creators such that the only game in town once again is the majors. Right, right. Is there a growing disconnect between how authors are, are viewing and dealing with piracy and how publishers are? I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> certainly the, I was uh, shocked when I was curating the Humble eBook Bundle, which, which you know, ended up making more than a million dollars for the authors who participated in right. it, to find that um, although I had authors from all of the big six who were eager to have their works included in the Humble Bundle, including ones who were multiple, long, enduring, number one New York Times bestseller authors, mm -hmm. uh, that their publishers said, you can't do this, not because we think it's a bad idea, but because we just can't imagine not releasing with DRM. Right? DRM is not negotiable here. It's, it's, it's DRM or nothing. Since the Humble Ebook Bundle was DRM free, those authors missed out on you know potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars sure. each. Right? So that, I think, does indicate a kind of disconnection between authors and publishers, but ultimately, you know, I think that um, the fact that people will copy the stuff that they like uh, is not a problem. It's a fact. Problems are things you can change. Uh, facts are things you have to get used to. So uh, I think it's safer to say that there is a disconnect between firms that understand and individuals that understand that this is a fact and who accommodate themselves to it and try to maximize their revenue in a world in which copying is a given, and the ones who still think that it's productive to devote enormous amounts of resource to trying to get food coloring out of the swimming pool, to try and stop things from being copied once they're digital. Mm -hmm. um, and those people, I think, are, are just kind of doomed because they're, they're, they're trying to hold back the sea. They have built a business model that requires that copying get harder as computers get faster and easier and more people know how to use them. 
That's not going to happen. Right? This is as hard as copying gets. Like here we are in 2013. This is like the hardest day for the rest of time for copying. Right. Right? Like your grandkids will marvel at how hard copying was in right. February of 2013, right? You know, like tell me again, Grandma, about the days in 2013 when you couldn't walk into a Walgreens and hanging in the in the checkout aisle were like six hard drives for a buck and each one of them is big enough to hold all the music ever made, all the movies yep. ever made, all the words ever spoken. When you know networks weren't fast and ubiquitous and and could transfer files, you know, big video files nearly instantaneously. When not everybody knew the magic incantation movie name space bit torrent to get a movie if they didn't want to pay for it. So um, if copying's only get harder the disconnection is between people who are betting on the like wildly improbable, which is that somehow we'll get more internet and less copying, right. and people who are uh, may not have a theory of how to make money, but at least everything they're trying assumes that copying only gets easier. Right? They they may not be right, but at least they're trying to solve the problem that is is actually the problem we need to solve, which is how do you make money when copying happens, and not the the unsolvable problem, which is how do you make less copying happen? Mm -hmm. How do you see the publishing industry moving beyond the piracy debate? Well, again, I think it's the same thing, right? I think that, that it, there, there will be an evolutionary uh, pressure, right? There will be publishers, entities involved in publishing that will accommodate themselves to reality, and there'll be ones that deny reality. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like, you know, at the risk of offending the young earth creationist watching this video. There are young earth creationists who are also in the oil industry, right? Right. famously. And the young earth creationists in the oil industry have accommodated themselves to the fact that they believe one thing very firmly to be true, but they don't tell their geoengineers to dig where the oil would be if the earth was only 5,000 years old. They say, like, assume that it's millions of years old and that there were dinosaurs, mm -hmm. and, and go from there because that's where you actually find oil. And there may be publishers who deeply believe that the right to control copying is a moral question and that it's something that you should never compromise on, but if they're going to be financially successful, they will be the publishers who, despite that deeply held belief, behave as though copying occurs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, changing direction just a little bit, um, and for my last question, how do you see the book as a user interface changing, if at all? Well, I think we haven't yet figured out what a networked book is. I mean, we don't have like a sui generis form. You know, okay. books are clearly like they're, 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 what a book is is a really, a really hard question, right? You know, yes. books, aren't, books, books aren't bound codices because the Bible was a scroll at one point and it was still a book, right? Um, books aren't printed things because there are things that aren't printed, they're hand lettered. Books mm -hmm. aren't physical things, we have e-books. Um, books aren't long things, we have short books. Books aren't things that are short because with electronic books you can have 15,000 page books. Right. So we don't know what any of those things are. But I think that um, with each new kind of media, what we do is we take the stuff that had been uncomfortably shoehorned into the old media because there was nowhere else for it to go, and we let it free in the new media. So before there were um, silver screens, we just had stages. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to tell a dramatic story, you had to mount it as a play. And there were a lot of things that probably should have been movies that could be shoehorned onto the stage. And then there were some things that just couldn't be, that just never got made. Mm -hmm. And the advent of the silver screen delaminated performance and all the stuff that was best suited to film moved from the stage to film. And all the stuff that could never be made until there was film began to be made. And then when the small screen came around, the same thing happened. You know, the, the Lone Ranger serials migrated slowly but surely from the big screen to the small screen. Right. And then when the tiny screen came out, the YouTube screen came out, it turned out that like there was nothing, like Moses didn't come down off the mountain with two tablets saying all programming shall be 22 or 48 <laughs> minutes long, right? right? And so now we've got a whole bunch of programming that turned out to have been lurking in potentia in the 22 minute and 48 minute schedule slot either stretched out or compressed to fit there or just never made at all because they didn't fit there. Mm -hmm. And I think that electronic books, we have yet to see which books needed to be electronic books and had been shoved into the printed book because that was the best we could do. I think technical books are probably pretty close to that. There are a lot of books about programming, for example, where you know the physical book might be something you lead on the, leave on the toilet to kind of, you know, uh, uh, refresh your memory in those in those boring moments right. but the actual book is something that you only access digitally 
Um, and, uh, but we also haven't figured out what books could never be made that had to be made digitally that people care about. I mean, there's been a lot of hypertext experiments, and some of them I love, um, but none of them, I think we have to admit, have caught fire. You know, John McDade's Uncle Buddy's Fun House and the, the Jeff Ryman book and some of the stuff Catherine Kramer did. And, you know, there is this whole multi-generation hypertextual literature thing, including the Infocom games and the new text adventures. Right. None of them have become what TV was to film yet. Uh, okay. And I, I, I'm anxious to see what it is. All right. Well, thank you very much for talking with me. Thank you.